Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome to Making It with me, your host, Terry Woolman. I really appreciate so very much you joining us every week on all of our shows, and and you are the reason that we do this show, is to share vital information uh, with artists and musicians and creative folks, and also people that are just fans, you know, that, that want to get a better idea of the creative process and and what it takes to, to really um, have a lasting career in the ever-changing landscape of the entertainment business. You know, that's what this show is about. Uh, by the way, you can find all of our episodes on entertalkmedia.com, Spotify, and iTunes podcast at Making It with Terry Wallman. You might want to grab a pen and paper for today's show to write down some of the tips that we will be sharing on how and where to find and create opportunities to get paid as a songwriter or composer. And that's because my guest today is Michael Laskow, the CEO of Taxi. Let me tell you a little bit about Michael. Michael Laskow has been helping songwriters, artists, and composers become successful in the music business since 1974. He began his career as an engineer at Criteria Studios in Miami during the studio's golden era of the 1970s. Some of the artists Laskow worked with include Eric Clapton, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, Neil Young, Firefall, Melanie, Joe Cocker, and many more. Helping independent songwriters, artists, and composers get their music heard by record labels, publishers, and film and TV music supervisors became his passion. Michael founded Taxi, the world's first independent A&R company, in 1992. For more than 27 years, Laskow and his team of music industry experts have helped thousands of musicians land indie and major record label deals, publishing deals, and countless placements in hit TV shows, feature films, TV commercials, and movie trailers. So let's get started. Michael Laskow, welcome to Making It. Thanks, Terry. Boy, I sound really good on paper. (laughs) You sure do. (laughs) Most of us do, you know, um, you know, which is always kind of humorous to me and, and almost every artist, uh, you know, on the show, and we've had some pretty amazing people from Alan and Marilyn Bergman and Keb Mo and, and Ken Craig and, you know, like music industry people, uh, entertainment right. actors, everybody seems to be blown away by hearing their resume read. <laughs> you know, and it's always, right. kind of, it's always kind of humorous to me. You know, they're, they've become very kind of humbled, <laughs> you know, by their credits as well. It should be, I mean, you know, and your career is a, is a great example, you know, uh, and you know, i We have a personal, we have many personal connections. You know, we both came up in Miami. I was born and raised in Miami. So your stories that you've told me over the years and, and some of the stories that you're going to share, um, working at Criteria and Trident and, and Miami, you know, really just bring back memories for me because that, everything that you were doing back then inspired me to want to be in the music business. You know, it, it was very exciting to be to walk into those studios in Miami and, and, you know, see Fleetwood back or Eric Clapton in the other room, you know, making these amazing records that, that you were a part of. Um, so thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. And, uh, I have many people who came before me to thank, uh, and I literally got my start in the industry by walking into a studio, which was criteria. Well, tell me about that, you know, before we talk about taxi, because I want to I want to focus on both things today. Um, Of course, taxi and and what that's about, but but really about you as well. So what what were you doing, you know, that that led you to walking into that into criteria? And what was your game plan? I mean, did you walk and say, hi, my name is Michael and I want to work here? Uh, it wasn't that glamorous or that well thought out, <laughs> frankly. Um, uh, I was actually going to college at the University of Miami. I was a business major. I was probably going to go to law school after I graduated. And 
the summer after my freshman year, I was a professional scuba diver working for a company called Reef Incorporated, teaching mostly guys in the Bahamas how to collect fish for aquariums uh, without harming them. So I'd spend like three days a week in the Bahamas. Uh, great job for a 19-year-old flying down you know, on a, on a little pontoon plane three mm-hmm. days a week. Teaching guys how to collect fish, cooking a lobster on a stick on a you know over an open fire on a beach, then flying home. And then one day I had a roommate who was returning a piece of musical gear, which by the way, I should preface this whole thing with I saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show ten years earlier when I was nine years old, turned around and said to my parents, When I grow up, that's what I want to do. <laughs> so I'd always had this thing in my, you know, heart and my head to want to be in the music industry, but like most people thought it was impossible. So jump ahead, I'm scuba boy, I'm uh, living in Miami, and a roommate went to a place called Ace Music, which I'm sure you remember, it's kind of like a, you know, like a guitar center, but Miami's version of it in the 70s. And I was milling around the store, you know, noodling on guitars, whatever, and I overheard somebody say, hey boss, uh, I'm taking the string ensemble over to Criteria for stills. And I whipped my head around (laughs) and went, Steven Stills? And he went, yeah. And I said, can I go with you? No. <laughs> uh, I, I begged, pleaded. I got only knows that, you know, I, I don't think I gave him any money, but I finally talked the guy into taking me. And he said, look, when we get there, sit in the lobby, don't talk to anybody, and I'll be out in 10 minutes after I set this thing up. Just behave yourself. Okay. So I'm sitting there, and an older gentleman, uh, which ironically, he was probably. Uh, younger than I am now. He walks through the lobby right with this hippie us. looking dude. And, uh, and, and the old guy in quotes says to the younger hippie guy, Man, this place looks like crap. We need somebody to clean up the lobby. And I jumped out of my chair, dropped my billboard magazine uh, on the floor. It was a, I remember it was like a Mexican tile floor and the spine of the magazine made this like quack sound. And he turned around and I he looked at me and I jumped out of my chair and raised my arm and started waving and said, I'll do it. He goes, do what? And I said, I'll clean your lobby. <laughs> and he looked at me like, what the hell? Where did you come from? So uh, he literally grabbed me by my shirt sleeve and took me over to the front door and gave me a little push and said, and stay out. <laughs> and so I looked through the glass door until he disappeared down the hallway, and I opened the door and said to the receptionist, is that the owner? She said, yeah. What's his name? Mac Emmerman. All right, yeah. cool, thanks. <laughs> so I called him five times a day for five days straight until Friday afternoon, 4 o'clock, 25th call of the week. He <laughs> actually came on the line and he said to me, look, kid, you're driving my receptionist crazy. If I interview you for a job here, which is going to be an internship if you get it, and you don't get the job, do you swear you'll never call here again as long as you live? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I jumped in my car. I drove up there. Got past the receptionist, walked up the stairs to his office, uh, knocked on the door, come in. I walked in, walked across the room, and before he could even stand up from his desk, I reached out, shook his hand, and said, I'll be the first one here, the last one to leave, and I won't let you down. And he looked Hmm. at me and said, okay, you got a job. Mm. That is perfect. (laughs) Yeah. And and, and that, that, that attitude has set the course of your career, too. Yeah, I mean, you know, you've got to, when an opportunity presents itself, you've got to be smart enough and and bold enough to go for it without being obnoxious. I think I was obnoxious with 25 calls. (laughs) (laughs) The first 24, right. (laughs) Right, exactly. So did you, where did you get your engineering background? Was it just from from learning, being there and being an apprentice? Yeah, I learned on the job there. Uh, As soon as I started, like the first day, they said, by the way, the uh, RIAA, Recording Industry Association of America, um, has a weekly class here, uh, you know, like an engineering 101 class, and you should take it. You can take it for free. And I said, great. So I took it, and the guy teaching it was named Carl Richardson. Who oh, Carl and engineer. Albie Gluten. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, I knew Carl. Uh, this, was actually, of this was actually even before Carl and Albie started working together, I believe, on, on the Clapton stuff. And uh, Carl was a great teacher. And yeah. uh, so I learned from his class, mostly microphone placement and microphone selection. Um, and on the job, I learned things like, getting track sheets right and labeling uh, tape boxes correctly and how to create up tapes that were worth millions and get them 
shipped off to a record label without getting them lost or destroyed. So, you know, all the kind of mundane, practical stuff you have to do as well. So let me ask you something. During during that time that you were working, that was really one of the epicenters of the music industry. So you had a front row seat, you know, to really watching the, the process of what it was like to make records and and really what it was like to be an artist at that time. And you've been in the music business for a long time. So comparing then and now, <laughs> you and me both, <laughs> uh, you know, comparing how things were back then to now, how would you say that that both music and the music industry has changed in addition to the the obvious ways? I mean, what's the essence, you know, what, is there a different feeling now or is it the same sort of, you know, blind, stupid passion that, you know, and, and, and vision that, you know, had you call 25 times is, is that, well, did it feel different both. back then? Okay. Um, it, it's both, you know, it still takes somebody who's passionate to want to be in it because you're going to get kicked in, in the ribs a thousand times before you succeed at anything. Um, so you've got to be driven by that burning desire, but, um, you know, it used to be that one person with an acoustic guitar and a great song could make it as a songwriter, let's say. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you've got to be good enough to get yourself networked with what's called a camp, meaning, you know, a, a group of writer producers, usually between three and six or seven people. And they're usually attached to an artist or two or three. And that's how you end up being a songwriter on big records. So it used to be, you know, a solo or a sole practitioner, if you will, could get, uh, learn their craft, you know, either by osmosis and listening to a lot of music and working really hard at it, and maybe even taking songwriting courses. Uh, but just, you know, doing it every day until you keep getting better. And it does take years. Well, eventually you'd get a, uh, you know, a publishing deal as a staff writer with Universal or Warner Chapel or somebody, and then they would pitch your material to big artists that had record deals. Um, nowadays, you become part of a camp, and frankly, I don't know how you become part of a camp. Hmm. Uh, I, I think that it, it's way harder as a sole practitioner to, to make it today's industry. It's interesting artist, that you would say that, Michael, that you don't know how to become part of a camp because you're, you know, you were still sort of on the front row, um, of the, the music industry. You know, you, you are constantly, uh, touring and doing public speaking and, and hosting your annual road rallies that we'll talk about later on the show. And so like, you've got a really good sense of the music business, but there's still a bit of a mystery or well, to yeah, you. Um... Yeah. There is, you know, I mean, Nashville is kind of unto itself and I see camps popping up there. And I think that in order to become part of a camp there, you've got to live there and mm -hmm. you've got to be around long enough that they realize you didn't just blow into town like a carpet bagger and expect everybody to recognize your greatness a, a week later. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, by going out and having a beer and meeting people and co-writing with people who are beneath you uh, on a skill level and then people above you on a skill level, eventually you will fall into a camp of people and hopefully that camp of people gets to write for some big artists and that's how you launch a career there. Mm -hmm. uh, pop music uh, is somewhat similar in LA and New York. Um, it, it's all about friendships and trust and you got to have enough craft that people are willing to bring you into their little, it's almost like a, a witch's coven or something, you know, <laughs> <That's true. laughs> you have to be invited into the secret club, but once you are, you know, if you can hold your own, it can be very, uh, you know, it can launch a career. Yeah. It's the Illuminati of the uh, music business. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, by the way, just a quick aside, did you ever, did you finish your business degree at university of Miami or ever go pursue becoming a lawyer or did you just, um, I didn't pursue yours? becoming a lawyer, but, uh, I've certainly hired a few. In my case. Um, <laughs> I did, I did finish my degree there. Ironically, uh, I ended up graduating with a, a business major and a minor in music. Now, the funny thing was, I wasn't good enough on any particular instrument to audition into the music program at University mm -hmm. of Miami, which you well know is one yeah, of the best. Extremely in the world. high level. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. 
and, and back then it was one of the few and, and you know, might have been the best. Um, and and they I, I knew I couldn't get in, but they had an audio engineering program that they started when I was like a junior in college. And they wouldn't let me in because I wasn't a music major and didn't audition in. So mm-hmm. my boss, Mac Emmerman, called up Dean Lee at the University of Miami and said, uh, "Will hey, Will I Lee's dad, keep... by the way? Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> Will Lee, the bass player's dad, absolutely." Mm-hmm. And he said, uh, "I want you to let this kid into the program." And Dean Lee said, "But the you know he's not auditioning in on an instrument. We can't let him in. Nobody's ever gotten in without auditioning." And Mac <laughs> said, "I give you a thousand hours a year to record your jazz band." let him in. <laughs> they let me in. <laughs> I didn't even have to pay anybody like certain famous actors. Uh, sure. <laughs> I'm not mentioning any names for you. Anyway. Right. <laughs> um, so I got into the program and it was, I think the first year that they launched it and they just completed Gusman Hall and put a studio in there. So it was great. I was, you know, learning stuff in college about what I wanted to do with my life. I was learning about business and uh, working on the job, the criteria, and eventually it kind of all came together later in my career. So one of the things I know about you is that you're a, a passionate reader. And, and also that you love reading about marketing and business books. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, we're going to be sharing stories of, of your expertise in marketing and business, but as a family man and also the CEO of a really thriving company, how do you find the time to read all the books that fascinate you? I'm just curious about time management. I can't believe I'm going to say this in public, but I read for an hour in the bathroom every morning. Wow. That's, that's, you know, something that's, that's a good tip. You know what I mean? It's like, cause nobody's going to bother you. <laughs> right. Exactly. My family knows don't go in there. Uh, right. <laughs> you know, frankly, there are times I go in there just to read and nothing else right. is just, sure. it, it's a quiet, it's quiet place. and peaceful. And I, yeah. If, <laughs> if you walked in our bathroom, I was actually just looking at this an hour ago. Um, we have a wooden stool in our bathroom, like one of those rectangular Asian looking wooden stools. And mm-hmm. there are exactly nine books on that stool right now. I was looking at them this morning thinking eight of those are half finished. I really need to finish them up and store them somewhere. But yeah, I, I, I'm a big believer. Uh, my company taxi would not be successful if not for what I've learned by reading mostly marketing books and to some extent management books. Right. So since you have a clear understanding of today's music business and you also have extensive experience in marketing, can you explain the term disruptive marketing, which I've been hearing about from other business people and, and share a few examples of how that works for you, you know, as a company owner or or how that might work for a songwriter or artist? Well, Clear communication, and and it's funny because I see the word disruptive and and chuckle to myself because (laughs) I think since uh, Uber disrupted the the taxi cab industry, um, (laughs) people love using uh, the word disruptive and attaching it to probably more things than they should. But look, marketing Mm -hmm. has always been somewhat disruptive, um, and, and people are turned off. The other day I showed somebody on my staff something I'd written. And she said, it sounds spammy. And this was a a 23-year-old millennial, and she said, it sounds spammy. And I said, spammy in what way? And she goes, well, it sounds selly. And I said, well, does selly mean spammy? And she goes, yeah, I never thought about that. But in order to get people to buy something from you or to listen to your new song or to download your music or to come to one of your shows, you do have to disrupt what they're doing and get their attention. And so every time you sit down to write a marketing piece or shoot a photograph for marketing or design a graphic for marketing um, or build a web page, you should always ask yourself, does it answer the question, what's in it for me from the reader's perspective or the viewer's perspective? Because nobody cares that, you know, Terry Wallman's going to play a gig Friday night at Rusty's Rib Ranch unless mm-hmm. they're already a fan. So you want to get new fans as well. What's the benefit for them? So you need to be a clear communicator and say, you know, um, 
they, they need to know that you're primarily a jazz musician. And what is it that makes your music different or better than another jazz musician's music? Uh, mm-hmm. So you've got to motivate them to take an action that you want them to take. And some people would call that clickbait today, you know, in the form of subject lines um, or maybe a, a headline on an email or a subject line in an email or a headline on a web page. But, you know, call it what you will. It all goes back to old school copywriting, which was largely kind of discovered in the 1920s and 30s, um, perfected in the 60s and 70s, and then in the 90s, people started applying those old school direct marketing style copywriting skills to the internet and email. And I find that it works really, really well. That's a great explanation. And I agree. It does work really, really well. It's you, you need to get people's attention and either, you know, your opening example of the 25 phone calls uh, to, to Mac at Criteria or even, you know, having the, um, the balls to, you know, get kicked out of the studio and then wait till the lobby was cleared and walk yourself back in again and sit down and right. resume being quiet, <laughs> you know, so that you didn't miss the opportunity, you know, t- that you hadn't been invited to, um, you know, to participate in. Um, there's something those, that I, I've noticed. I'm oh, sorry. I didn't mean to step on you. There. No, it's okay, Michael. Go ahead. Uh, something I've noticed during my entire career, and this is true of musicians and other creative types, whether they're visual artists or authors or whatever, they don't like to market themselves. Um, people. Hate is it that themselves. they don't like to market themselves or they're, they're not really qualified or capable. Well, they've not become qualified or capable because they'd be embarrassed to do it. People hate to ask anybody to give them money. People don't want to say, hey, buy my thing, you know, or or do this. They want somebody else to do it for them. They just want to be creative, and I understand that. They just want to make their music and have somebody else swoop in and magically, uh, you know, put them on a magic carpet and, and take them to whatever their desired destination is. But in today's industry, music industry, and I guess this goes back to the first question you asked me, is if you're an artist trying to make it, you've got all these tools, uh, you know, vis-a-vis the internet, uh, and you've got um, social media, you've got email, you've got websites, you've got podcasts, you've got, uh, you know, downloadable music, you've got a zillion places to stream music, but why would somebody want to stream your song versus... 10,000 others. You've got to answer that question. What's in it for me from the Mm -hmm. listener's perspective. So if you can drop a hint as to what kind of music it is by the way the song is titled rather than some obscure title like Marsha's song. um, (laughs) What if it was like, uh, you know, down and out blues. That's a really bad example, but at least, you know, it's blues. So if you're a fan of the blues, you're you're going to be more motivated to listen to that than uh, you know an orchestral piece or something. So right, yeah. even something as simple and little as the title of the song really matters in the grand scheme of things. Absolutely. Let's let's talk about Taxi a little bit. Um, I, I want you to give a brief description about what your company does and is, and also what your mission statement was when you and and your co-founder Michael Letterer first visualized creating this company that that was doing, you know, you came up, you filled a void that existed, and you came up with a a solution that was multifaceted that that accomplished more than just one thing, um, including mentoring. You know, so like what I'm curious about how you would describe your company and what your mission statement was when you first sat in in that room in Miami thinking we should start a company? Well, Michael Letter, who is my former business partner and closest friend in the world, uh, was my RA at the University of Miami. And uh, we both loved hanging out in his dorm room or mine and, and brainstorming business ideas back in the 70s. And we used to say, God, you know, someday when we grow up, we should start a business together. So uh-huh. <laughs> after I had done, I don't know, 10 or 15 years in the studio, uh, and then I ended up managing a big audio, uh, probably the biggest audio post facility in the country, if not the world. And then 
uh, moved to L.A. and was managing a big general post-production facility in Los Angeles, I missed those moments when I'd be in the studio, even though I'd worked with a bunch of big artists, there were moments with little, tiny, independent, unknown, unsigned artists where magic happened in the room. And I loved the look on their face when the track was coming together and they're all on the other side of the glass from me looking at each other like, wow, we're really doing this. Or when they'd come in the control room and listen to a playback and go, holy crap, is that us? <laughs> I love that. It, it, to me, I felt like I was flying you know, an F-16 or something, sitting at the console, bringing all these musical elements together in a way that made the, the musicians feel really good about what they were doing, and I knew that it would translate to listeners as well. So that was always in the back of my mind to get back to that. And then I realized that when I worked with those artists, um, the smaller independent unsigned artists, they all had one thing in common. When the, After they'd blown their life savings to go to a real studio, because you needed to then, because you know, right. Pro Tools didn't exist and neither did laptops, uh, they, they would save up five, ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 and go record demos, and then they couldn't get them to anybody. And I just remembered that and said, you know what? I heard about this thing called America Online, and I joined, and I instantly hmm. saw that, wow, you can communicate with a lot of people using this. It wasn't even called the Internet yet. Right. Um, and so I called up Michael Letter and said, I've got an idea for a business. I need money. Uh, do you want to invest? And the plan was to create a network whereby people in the industry told us what they needed at any moment in time whether it was a song or a certain type of artist. And then we would disseminate that information using uh, America Online to tell the artists and, and songwriters and composers what was needed by the companies. Then the writers, artists, and composers would send music that was specifically for each of those requests, if they had it, to us. And I hired a room full of people that sat there and listened to every single song that came in for each request, and their mission was to determine, is it on target for what was asked for, number one, and is it good enough that they'll listen to it and go, wow, I'm glad they sent me this. It's not wasting my time. So that was the mission, but I, I realized early on that it had to be about more than just access. It had to be about education because somebody mm -hmm. could be really talented on a musical level and be really uneducated about how the industry works. So I see this still to this day where people get offered a publishing deal and they end up blowing the deal because they're ignorant. And I mean that in the kindest way. They just don't know what a typical publishing deal looks like or what a fair deal is uh, or that publishing deals for film and TV are – pretty different from a publishing deal for hit songwriters signing to Warner Chapel, for instance. Mm -hmm. So our mission all along has been to be a service of access to the industry when you've earned it and to educate you both on a musical level and on a business level to get you to the point where you get those connections and then don't blow them. So that's what we do. We help songwriters, artists, and composers get their music to record labels, publishers, and film and TV people that need music for shows and movies. You also do it without taking a commission, which is a really different business model than any other that I know and that I would imagine that you know. Um, you, well, I mean, you, I mean you, yeah, do, you, know, you charge to be – you become a member of Taxi. Um, right. You know, when, um, I tell people because a lot of times people ask me about taxi because I've had the the honor of mentoring uh, and being a part of your your company for on and off for many many years and and still um, really enjoy mentoring for your annual road rallies and and you know thank you and we love having you oh I appreciate that and you know but the but the thing is I remember when I I tell people and I I told you the other day when when I had invited you on the show that when I first met you you know and I heard all of these things I just thought what's the catch you know this sounds too good to be true and there is no catch it's just you created a business model that's different than any other business model and you also provide mentoring there's a mentoring aspect because you know uh, you can't forward everybody for every single you know every song 
for every single listing, regardless of how talented people are. And instead of one of the things that made me want to be a friend of yours for all these years and also to be involved with your company was because you, you thought, well, what can we do besides just saying no? How can we be of service to the the composers? And you figured that out. The, the way was to give back very concise, productive feedback on where they might have missed the mark on that song. You know, what else they could have done to get it closer to what that listing specifically was asking for. And that's one of the things that you guys really focus on. It's not, you know, you said this before when I hear you do public speaking or on your um, Taxi TV YouTube channel, um, which I encourage everybody to go look at these information packed, um, you know, videos that, that Michael does. Um, but you, you basically, you find a way to give them a piece of information that will help them become a better and more successful songwriter and target towards each individual job or gig or opportunity. And that's so cool that you do that. Well, thanks. You know, to me, it just seems like it's necessary and you're right. (laughs) Right. We don't take a percentage. Um, and the reason we don't is I looked at friends of mine in the industry when I had the idea for the company and friends that were publishers or managers or, or A&R people, they had good years and they had bad years. And typically they had a lot of skinny years. So like I, I knew um, somebody who was a big time manager, a close friend of mine, who made a million bucks one year in a single hmm. year managing an artist hmm. and then didn't make anything for the next five years, at least nothing significant. So, you know, he could have gone and paid taxes on that and walked away with a half a million and spent that on a house, and he wouldn't right. have had any grocery money for the next five <laughs> years. So I remember when I had the idea for the company, I went, I'm just going to charge a flat fee. But I did something that people – I wanted people to know that we weren't some sort of scam because there are people out there. There are a lot of scammers out there. Hey, right. can, you know, pay me some money and I'll listen to your music, kid, You know, with a cigar hanging out of their mouth. <laughs> I needed right. to be the opposite of that guy in that company. So um, – we offer an entire year money back guarantee. So it costs 300 bucks to join taxi and you get two free tickets to our convention, which you mentioned we'll talk about at some point today. Mm-hmm. So right there, you've already gotten way more than your money's worth. Cause if you go to any of the other music conventions out there, they're typically between 300 and a thousand dollars. Well, join taxi and you get two free tickets to what people say is the best convention of its kind out there. I would um, agree. And also, why don't we talk about it? Well, why don't you elaborate on that right now? And then we'll continue your thought since we're talking about okay. the road. It's called All the right, road so rally. We, right. We do the taxi road rally every year. I think we're coming up uh, on our 24th road rally, November wow. 7th through the 10th. We do it here in Los Angeles. Um, like and I I'll said, be there, by the way. Yay. Awesome. So, <laughs> Love to, I only see yeah. your face once a year typically, but I'm glad that I see you there. <laughs> Me too. So, uh, you know, we get about uh, between 2,000 and 2,500 musicians that come from literally all over the world. I mean, as far away as Asia, Australia, South America, Iceland, uh, Norway, Denmark. Anyway, um, it's three and a half days of really high quality, high level panels with industry people. Um, we have uh, one-to-one mentoring uh, with people. I'm sure you've done that for us where you go mm-hmm. one-to-one 15 minutes at a time with people. So somebody who's a jazzer can look on the list of bios and go, wow, look at this guy, Terry Woolman, man, that dude's got a resume. And they can actually book 15 minutes for free with you. And they can sit down and play your music and ask you, am I there yet? If I'm not, what could I be doing differently? Or not play any music and say, Terry, how did you get networked into this jazz world? How do you know all these right. people? How do you, you know, business advice or musical advice, basically. Mm-hmm. Complete access, so that, yes. Yeah, and, and that's just one little part of what we do. So during the course of the weekend, we typically have about 17 panels in the ballroom. We have somewhere around 75 to 90 breakout classes. We have a, an industry, we call it industry eat and greet uh, luncheon two days <laughs> in a row. So you can uh, be at a table where we rotate the mentors around the tables every 15 minutes. So you can meet a manager for 15 minutes and producer and then a label person and a film and TV person. So and maybe the 
best thing that the road rally provides is networking on a level that most people can't believe until they see it with their own eyes. Um, other conventions, there's a lot of competition, and people are really uh, like, hey, check me out in my cool leather pants and all my studs, you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> and taxi, the road rally is not like that. It, I don't know why, but it's become almost family-like and incredibly supportive where somebody who's making mm -hmm. 200 grand a year might be standing next to somebody who's an absolute rookie that's scared to death of coming to this big convention for the first time. Will I fit in? I'm going to be intimidated. What do I do? Which things should I go to? And lo and behold, they're standing in the registration line. They meet somebody. It's, this is their 10th road rally, and they're now making 200 grand a year because of their taxi membership. And the more senior member ends up building a friendship with the um, newbie member and they end up working together and the new member just by showing up at the road rally gets to figuratively ride the coattails in of that more experienced better connected member just because they showed up so i think it's not was just it woody that. allen that oh, said, you know or somebody somebody said a big part of success is just showing up whoever said that was right absolutely and and in addition to showing up actually being present like and being open and, and having the the courage or the or the the willingness just to say hi my name's terry right yeah you know, this is my this is my first time here what's your name yeah yeah uh, you know, absolutely and, and, the, and that can, like you said, that can fast track you. Just that friendliness, that enthusiasm, that passion that you and I both have and that anybody who's successful has in any business, you just, you bring that enthusiasm and passion. You don't just stand there in line and show up. You really show up, you know, so showing up means like just being present, being open, um, curious, um, appreciative, you know, all of those things. And, and it's so, um, Nice to hear that those experiences happen uh, at your annual road rallies, and and I'm not surprised, you know, because there is a feeling of community there. That's that's very can strong. I, uh, can I take yes. thirty seconds to read something I saw on the taxi online forum this morning, which goes yes. right to what we're talking about? Absolutely. So this is from a guy whose name is Kyle Sutton in Frederick, Maryland, and he posted on our success story thing: first Kardashians placement and a long one too. I was thrilled to hear and see that my urban comedy cue is used in the latest episode of Keeping Up with the Kardashians. It's a nearly 40-second placement, which is quite long, uh, mm -hmm. during which Chloe scours the house looking for a runaway hamster. Priceless. <laughs> Here's the track, and he puts a link to the track in there. He says, no way, uh, no way this ever would have happened without Taxi. Heck, I wasn't even writing urban comedy cues uh, as of a few <laughs> months ago. But I was fortunate enough to meet a uh, production music library owner at the last road rally and received a gracious introduction from fellow taxi member Ron Kajawa. So grateful to Michael and this amazing community from Kyle Sutton. So mm. we, we see hundreds of those after every road rally. And there you go. So here's a guy named Kyle Sutton who meets another guy named Ron Kajawa. And rather than Ron being precious and selfish and stingy with his contacts, he must have heard Kyle's music and go and says to him, dude, I know uh, a production music library, which is a film and TV specific uh, publisher. You know, I, I know somebody that would eat your stuff up. Want me to introduce you? Sure. Mm -hmm. So they mosey into the bar, I'm sure, you know, at the end of the day and they see the publisher grabbing a beer and they start a conversation. Lo and behold, Kyle Sutton gets a deal and because he showed up and, and his music was good. And, now he's got his stuff on TV, probably the first time in his life, too. That's great to hear. What, yeah. Hey, Michael, so since you, you're out in the public a lot, you travel, you just got back from speaking in Hawaii, and, and you do your weekly shows and everything, and, you know, you're really like, you're in the trenches. You, you know, you're not an unaccessible CEO. What's the number one question that you get asked by composers and songwriters and artists? Um. How can I get my music to somebody? Mm -hmm. They, they mm -hmm. all want to know that. It's like everybody just wants the shortcut. Um, <laughs> they, um, frankly, it, it's a little sad, sometimes almost a little embarrassing. <laughs> and I am on a mission to change all this. But people just want – it's like 
I make music. I love my music. A few of my friends and family members love my music. I'm sure it's really good uh, and good <laughs> enough to get you. So how do I get it to somebody? They don't think about how do I get it to the right somebody? Because, you know, getting a, a, an ukulele song to somebody that is the music supervisor on a show about hot rod cars on the History Channel, they don't need ukulele music. They need probably heavy metal. Um, so you, you've got to think just beyond I'm really good. You know, think about who needs what and when they need it. Those are the keys. So what are some of the answers that you give them? I, I, I know you encourage people to do their homework, to read. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've heard you speak about uh, go talk to other successful artists in your area and borrow their techniques. Uh, and you mostly you talk about taking charge of your own career. I do. Um, again, it goes back to people waiting for that person to show up and put them on the magic carpet ride to success. Um <laughs> I've been in the industry for like 40 years and I've never that I can. Yeah, I've never seen that ride. (laughs) Right, exactly. Um, Look at one point, Katy Perry was was one of the taxi A&R team members here because uh, she had a record deal and lost the deal. And she was broke, man. She she called me a couple of years ago and said, you know, I've always wanted to call and thank you. Um, She actually was riding with Max Martin in, in Sweden and she called me from the studio, I believe, and said, I was just thinking about you, and, you know, do you know that I was so broke when I was working for you that I had to go to Rent-A-Rec and rent a car to come Mm. out to your office and work because my car had been repossessed? So thank you. So Hmm. even somebody is talented, and she is immensely talented. You could literally feel it standing three feet from her. You knew she was going to make it, but she still had to go through the process of paying her dues. And so that's what I tell people is – don't expect to be swept off your feet. Somebody's just going to tap you on the top of your head with a magic wand and everything's going to change overnight. Chances are, like, if they join Taxi, because frankly, I think it's the, the best way for most people, not all, but for most people to get their start in the industry, join Taxi. But don't join Taxi if you think that you're going to send in one or two or three pieces of music in the first 30 days and everybody's going to swoon and the magic carpet's going to show up at your front door and, and whisk you off to a magical career. It doesn't work. But if you have the idea or, or the mindset that the first year is kind of like training wheels, um, you're going to learn more about the industry. You're going to learn about your strengths. You're going to learn about what you need to improve. And you're going to learn the language of the industry, which is very important. You're going to learn um, the difference between publishing deals and film and TV publishing deals. All those things are what you're going to learn in that first year for 300 bucks, And then in the second year, maybe you'll earn two, 300 maybe 500 or 1000 Maybe you'll get lucky and earn a couple thousand. But you're still not going to be a star or a major success. The taxi members have come up with the phrase, the five-year plan. They did that hmm. on their own. And basically what it says is plan on doing this for five years, and sure enough, The majority of our six-figure earning members all would tell you that it took them five years to get some traction, probably to make, you know, like between ten and fifty thousand a year. But then in years five to ten is when they go from fifty grand to a hundred and fifty grand a year. We've actually got one member who in twenty fourteen or twenty fifteen told me he was making two hundred and eighty grand a year all from placing what I affectionately call stupid little instrumental cues in in reality (laughs) shows, Uh, you know, like the Kardashian thing that we just talked about. And he's the biggest proponent of the five-year plan. So uh, if if you're asking for what I tell people, what advice I give them, it's be prepared for a five-year run. But if you do it on a regular basis with intent and with focus – for five years and not think about it for five years, actually do it for five years, you will probably at some point be able to walk away from the day job you hate and do music as your full-time gig. Which is not unlike uh, many other uh, paths that people take in their careers. You know, it, you know, I parked cars the first year I worked here. I also toured with Billy Preston, but you know, and, and I'm, I'm referring to these stories because Pretty much everybody that I've interviewed or almost everybody 
No, I would say everybody. They had their jobs. They, they were whether it was scuba diving, you know, which some were more yep. fun than others, or parking cars, or you know, some pretty well known people driving taxis their first year or two out here. Um, it was you know a basically a five year plan. You know that was slow and steady with with a sense of purpose and keeping your eye on the ball and not getting distracted um, by other things. So that that makes perfect sense. And uh, it's cool that that the members have come up with that term themselves. Yeah, you know, not only did they come up with that, but they came up with another one. I'm actually looking at a bumper sticker on my desk <laughs> that the members made and gave me one just to, as a here you go, dude. Uh, and it says, write, submit, forget, and repeat. And it's a takeoff <laughs> on the, you know, wash, right. rinse, and repeat. Um, write the music. Submit the music. Forget that you submitted it. Don't sit there and dwell on, wow, I wonder if Taxi's going to forward it. I wonder if the person on the industry end is going to take it. And sit there and stare at your mailbox or your telephone waiting for them to light up with the big offer. Just keep making more music because with every piece you do, you do get better. Even if the next piece sucks, you're still a better writer and or producer and or engineer because most people are doing their own stuff at home. Um, you're better than you were with the last piece. And you ultimately, one of the keys to success is it's a numbers game. So right. don't pin your hopes on one piece of music. Um, pin your hopes on you've got 200 of those, what I affectionately call stupid little instrumental cues. <laughs> that you've got 200 of those um, with three or four or five or ten different uh, film and TV specific publishers. That's when you start to get traction and you start getting a couple placements a month or a few a month, and then it just builds. And it, the cool thing is, especially with film and TV stuff, it's cumulative. Mm -hmm. So after five years, you might have 500 tracks out there in the wild. Well, after 10 years, you might have 1,500 out there because you get faster every year. And, and that's when you start to make serious money. You've got to have enough seeds planted in enough gardens to see the plants start to grow and bear fruit. Well said. Yeah, Michael I was a little surprised I came up with that, actually. <laughs> no, that's good. <laughs> right. As it was go back rolling and... off my tongue, I'm going, wow, I actually sound like wow. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, well, surprise, you do. You, you can go back and reread your resume at the end of our conversation and if you ever need a little moral boost <laughs> of <Thanks>. accomplishments. <laughs> As, as we all, you know, like anybody who's great at what they do, I think um, we we all do tend to lose perspective on ourselves occasionally. <laughs> so I, 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 I absolutely get that. So, you know, since our conversation is is live and completely unedited and you're not speaking at any particular form or function or anything, so there's no limitations on the answer to the question I want to ask you. Is there anything that you'd like to say to listeners, musicians, composers, um, performers that you've never had the opportunity to? Like what really, <laughs> what is it that you always want to just say that you kind of hold back on because it might not feel appropriate or the, the right time or place? I don't think I've ever held back anything, quite <laughs> frankly. And I'm, and, and I'm not that guy, you know, I'm not one of those right. people like sticks. I'm just not built that way. But I, there is. Well, I did have a guy come up to me the other day, uh, a guy from Russia that was complaining about how much America sucked. And I said to him, then why don't you go back to Russia? <laughs> that was a one-off. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, now, you know what? Uh, don't feel entitled. Hmm. Just because you want it doesn't mean that the world, the universe, God, or anything else or anybody else – owes you your dream but you have to have the dream uh, and then you have to develop the dream into a plan if i want to be uh, i'm going to go back to film and tv if i want to be a tv composer and make two hundred thousand dollars a year what's my plan because i shouldn't feel entitled that just because i want it and i think i'm really good that somebody's going to bestow that upon me no magic carpet so develop a plan 
what did other people do? And I'm stealing this from Tony Robbins and other self-help gurus. Mm -hmm. You can always model somebody who's done it before you. Uh, You don't have to come up with too much original stuff. Just, um, well, how did they start out? What what did they do the first year? What did they do the second year? And just follow their plan and customize it to your skill set and your needs and your plan as needed. But if you don't have a plan, you you know, if you don't have a plan and a map, you're not going to get to the destination. So what is your destination? Can you say that clearly? I And you, let's, again, go back to film and TV. Um, I want to be an instrumental composer for film and television. Okay, great. Well, who else has done exactly what I want to do? How did they get there? How long did it take them? How many hours a week did they do it? Uh, did they start out doing just like solo acoustic guitar cues? Uh, did they start out doing big orchestral instrumental cues, you know, like movie score type stuff? Uh, what's the easiest way to get experience with the drill? You know, how, how, how long should cues be? Do they need an intro, a verse, a, 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 a B verse, a, or a pre chorus, a chorus? A bridge, do they need all those elements, or is an instrumental cue just an A section with a four, eight bar B section in the middle to break up the monotony? They need to realize that their instrumental cue is not the most important thing going on in the show. The script and the actors and the dialogue and the characters are the most important thing, and your music is there to support the emotion or the action. So all those things can be learned by just observing what those who have come before you have done. And that's my deep advice. <laughs> mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that. We we have five minutes left in our conversation, so I want to get to our closing questions, which we could take an hour to answer, but we're going to do it in five. <laughs> so, okay. it's, it's, and there's three questions. The first is a two part question. Since this show is called Making It, what does making it mean to you, both personally and professionally? And the second part of that question is, can you share three tips for success that have driven your career? Okay. What does making it mean to you? What making it means to me personally is earning income doing something I love. And I'm I'm a family guy. I, I'm I was born and bred to be a guy who had a family and <laughs> provided for them. And so for me, making it is earning enough money that I can afford to send my kids to college, that we can live. And we don't live in a, in a fancy, fancy house, but we live in a nice enough neighborhood. Um, you know, we do okay. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not rich. People want to believe that I'm rich. <laughs> I, I, I'm being perfectly honest. We're comfortable. Yes. Um, and, and so that is making it for me. Uh, I didn't – I've never wanted to own a Bentley or a Ferrari or have a 20,000-square-foot house. So that's my definition of making it. What was the second half of the question? Can you share three tips for success that have driven your career? Um, Yes, recognizing opportunity. uh, This goes obviously back to the beginning of my career. Recognizing opportunity and and being bold enough to reach out and and seize the moment. And I know that sounds like something you read in a book, but if you actually do it, you could have success. You Mm -hmm. certainly have to start somewhere. Um, Second tip would be... to be humble. Um, there's always somebody faster, smarter, better than you are. And, and even when you become successful, don't take that for granted and, and just be humble about it. That's why I read virtually every day of my life because there's always something new to learn. Uh, and the third tip for success is don't let social media help you burn bridges. Uh, yesterday morning, uh, or no, uh, Sunday, as I was packing up to leave the hotel and fly back to L.A. from from the seminar I was at or convention I was at, uh, I checked my laptop one more time and I saw on Twitter that one of our taxi members who I really like, and he's a good person with a good heart and, and just a respectful, humble guy, but he posted something political about racism um, mm-hmm. on Twitter. And I responded to him privately and just said, Eh, you know, might not have been the best idea. Um, so you have to realize that when you're trying to make it, 
um, especially getting involved with things like religion and politics in a public forum, you know, which social media certainly is, it's a small industry. So if I saw that guy's post, maybe another 20 or 30 people that, that are really, you know, integral to our part of the industry saw that as well. And maybe some of them don't agree with this guy politically, and maybe they thought, hmm, I'm not going to use that guy's stuff anymore. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think that social media is, is wonderful and very dangerous at the same time. So just watch how you present yourself publicly. Act like a professional and be a professional, and professional things will come to you. Mm-hmm. My closing question is, at this point of your life, with everything that you know to be true, what would you tell your younger self? Wow, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, You really can be anything you want to be if you're just willing to work hard enough at it. When I started Taxi, I had $22,000 in the bank. My partner then partner, um, Michael Letterer, gave me 60 grand to start the company. I burned through that very quickly. I didn't understand how much it would cost for marketing and advertising. And my wife and I, were well, we were engaged at the time, uh, and we were so broke that we were literally uh, looking under cushions on the couch to find change to go to a bar and order a Diet Coke so we could eat the free nachos and peanuts on the bar and that was like date night for us Mm. we couldn't pay rent and buy groceries at the same time we were so broke and and i I mean i was literally taking eviction notices off of my door every month for about a year and a half always just making it by the hair of my chinny chin chin and i realized uh one day when i was about five or six or seven years into it one of my daughter's was very young, said to me, I've learned something from you that I will have for the rest of my, you've given me a gift I'll have for the rest of my life. And I said, what's that, sweetie? And she said, you taught me that you can be anything you want in life if you're willing to work hard enough at it. Hmm. Yep. Beautiful. Beautiful. Doesn't get more, more profound than that. Thank you so much for sharing that story and, and all of this information. I encourage everybody to go to taxi.com. We're going to post the link to our site. And uh, Michael, uh, thank you for spending the hour with us and with me. And Uh, and I really appreciate you and all the work that you're doing. Well, thank you. I'm I'm humbled by the invitation. Grateful for it. Really enjoyed the time with you, too. Thanks. And thank you, everybody, for joining us and listening. And we'll see you next week. Episode of Making It with Terry Wolf.